Okay, let, let's wait one minute to give everybody a chance to, to join us and, and, and we start. Good morning. <clears throat> I think I start. Um, um, okay, I stop sharing the screen. So, voila. So, uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, <clears throat> edition of uh, of Data at Breakfast. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione and almost two years ago I started this bad habit, habit of waking you up early uh, on a Friday morning. Yeah? As, as most of you know, originally this webinar series was really connected to, uh, to a physical breakfast uh, once a month, but since um, <clears throat> the COVID pandemic uh, hit us, uh, we moved online and since there was demand for it, we, we, we make it an almost weekly uh, weekly event. So welcome uh, everybody and sorry we can't offer you breakfast but um, I'm sure everybody can organize his own cup of coffee because <clears throat> we had speakers complain about the fact that we didn't offer them coffee before. Yeah? Uh, so this morning we are, we are very fortunate to have uh, uh, Wim Hugo uh, with us <clears throat> and let me um, maybe before I, I, I share with you his, uh, his, his bio uh, let me tell you because I'm very interested in, in, uh, in his talk and very happy that he found the time to join us, although he's in between two jobs at the moment. Yeah? So Wim will speak about uh, open science, which is a, <clears throat> a very, uh, I think, very important new, new development in, in, in the global science <clears throat> enterprise that uh, many nations, many governments are preparing policies or have already prepared policies or are preparing policies <clears throat> to, to, to change a little bit the rules of the games of how we, how we do science in an, in an open way. And even our South African government, and I'm sure we will we'll mention it, is in the process of, of, of finalizing uh, a, policy, a policy document. So Hugo has been a, uh, until recently, the Chief Information Officer of the South African Environmental Observation Network, and he was the chair <coughs> of the WDS uh, Scientific uh, Committee. He will soon uh, leave South Africa for a position in, in, in Japan, in Tokyo, where he'll be the Director of Strategy for the World Data System. So he really knows what he's, what he's going to, to talk about. Yeah. <coughs> he's always worked on uh, data management, infrastructure, <coughs> data architectures, yeah, and, and in particular also on, uh, on frameworks for evidence-based decision support, yeah, which is one of the things that we are, we are promoting in our Data Breakfast, uh, data breakfast series. And on the <coughs> invitation to the, to the webinar, there is a link where you can uh, uh, read his, uh, his whole uh, very impressive CV. Yeah? And, and this morning, Hugo will speak about open science and societal benefit, it needs a bit of work. Yeah? And uh, Hugo, please let us know what, what we have to do. Yeah? <clears throat> and before you, maybe we start sharing your screen. While you do that, uh, uh, please, uh, <clears throat> all participants, uh, you all know at the bottom of the Zoom windows, there's a Q&A button. Please use that, uh, that facility to ask uh, <clears throat> questions to, to Wim. And Dr. Sinaiski, who you see also on the panel, will after Vim's talk coordinate the, the question and, and answer session. So Vim, thank you very much for being with us this morning and, and over to you. Sorry, Wim. I think you are um, muted. Wim, you are muted. Yeah. Um. Okay, okay, let's try again. Yeah. <laughs> good yeah. morning, yeah. everyone. Yeah, now you are in business. Yeah, thanks, Francesco, and good morning, everybody. Um, as Francesco indicated, we will be talking about uh, open science this morning and the notion that uh, there will be 
uh, some societal benefit uh, coming from this movement. Um, but as we indicated in the invitation, there's quite a lot of, uh, of hidden uh, impediments to this that we will go into in much more detail today. So Open Science is a movement uh, that is hoping to make the efforts of scientific research, the findings, publications, data samples, uh, code, algorithms, and so on, uh, much more accessible and openly available to the general public and researchers specifically. It's generally seen to have maybe six or so different uh, subtopics, uh, open data, open source code and algorithms, access methods, resources, and review processes. My focus has been more towards the left-hand side of what you see on your screen, working with open data and open access, and the code and algorithms that, um, that are uh, involved in producing scientific output. Now, um, open science, uh, as I said, has been touted as having uh, significant uh, benefits to decision and policy making. But this, to my mind, is an assumption that needs quite a lot of investigation because in my experience, this is not so simple. And to better understand these issues, I'm going to quickly review the this landscape of open science, look at perspectives of the scientists and, the, and society, and then look at the, the gaps between what science can provide and what society expects. And if we have time, we will also look a little bit at, um, at the future and things that are being done to improve the situation. So um, before we start, you'll also notice a little propeller head in the top right corner of the screen. This is my attempt to try and classify the content uh, in terms of accessibility to the general public, but I'm happy to say that uh, for most of the time, we are no higher than level three, so uh, it should be fairly understandable. Okay, so what are the aspirations and the uh, rationale and objectives and the impediments of, of open science? Um, so first of all, um, the, it has some lofty aspirations. Uh, I was recently involved in a task team that had to write inputs for UNESCO on the future of open science. Uh, my part in that was relatively small, but the team came up with, uh, with very ambitious uh, statements, such as the one that you see there on the screen, that open science is the necessary transformation of scientific practice to adapt to the changes, challenges, and opportunities of this century, uh, especially in the digital era. Uh, to advance knowledge and to improve our world. Now, these kinds of statements are very common. We see them all over the place in declarations and in, uh, let's say, statements endorsed by, by meetings and international gatherings. Um, but uh, again, the devil is always in the detail. And if one starts looking at how, you know, how to achieve these, these very ambitious goals, uh, that's where you run into quite a lot of trouble. So we have big objectives in open science, uh, first and foremost, and I think from a scientist's point of view, potentially the most important aspect of open science is to improve the reproducibility of science and in cases where reproducibility is not part of the scientific process, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, more robust verification and open discourse about the findings. But from a funder's perspective, and there we can include society in general, because ultimately a lot of science is funded by taxpayers, we want an improved return on that investment. So within science, we can try and improve it by supporting the reuse and transdisciplinary application of research outputs and then within society, we hope to improve decision outcomes based on evidence. And there are also some significant drivers for open science. Um, 
The first is that we are facing unprecedented pressure from global change, um, not only in the natural world, but also in the, the built environment and in socioeconomic terms. And then technology, of course, both enables new, new ideas and new methods in science, and it also um, requires uh, new mechanisms for, uh, for doing the science that we do. So those are the big, the big picture objectives, drivers, and aspirations uh, of open science. Um, there are many impediments, but I'm summarizing some of the, the more commonly expressed ones here. Um, there are still throughout the, the world, and especially in South Africa, intellectual property legislation barriers, and it's complicated in many cases to determine the ownership and copyrights in jointly funded research uh, outputs. So this is an area where government needs to play a role. There's a lack of incentive expressed by scientists and of course our measurement techniques for the impact and, and relevance of the work that scientists are doing are completely married to an older system of dissemination of scientific ability. And then there's a few other um, uh, impediments. One of the very important ones that one shouldn't overlook is that the current uh, paper use uh, industry for publication of scientific uh, research is worth at least 50 billion US dollars a year. So this is a powerful um, force for uh, shaping, if not impeding, the, the future of open uh, science. And one has to be in conversation with them and also understand that there will be resistance to, uh, to measures that do not suit their, their future view. Um, there's also almost a perennial lack of infrastructure and funding. It's common for governments to formulate policies without thinking about how it will be funded. And uh, one shouldn't make that mistake again, certainly in South Africa, if we are looking at establishing an open science environment. And then, of course, there's always in a developing country, a lack of human uh, capacity in, in research. Um, open science also has some legitimate concerns. These include the fact that privacy and ethics uh, mitigate against the complete open availability of some research results, but that is really just a systemic or technical issue that has to be addressed uh, with due concern. Um, there are some unintended consequences uh, to unfaltered and unmediated access to, to open data. It's happening now in the, during the COVID pandemic. So there's a good uh, illustration of this situation. And there is also um, some precedent uh, where there's a very good article written by a colleague of mine about the situation after the nuclear accident in Fukushima earlier in the decade in Japan where there was a massive uh, use of unvalidated and basically false information by the general public in the aftermath of, of the accident. And then of course, there are some legitimate limitations to open data, including the cost of making the system work, because if I can openly find and apply very large data sets for argument's sake, and commit them to cloud-based uh, processing that is essentially free to me. Someone has got to pay for this somewhere along the line. Uh, so the allocation of these costs in an open environment is not, uh, not very clear to, to us at the moment. Now, these are concerns that are generally expressed by, um, by people in the developed world, but there are many others uh, in the developing world that have not been listed, and we are busy investigating these on behalf of a, a working group uh, of international data organizations and busy documenting it. And a lot of what I have to say today actually comes uh, from this work and we'll explore it a little bit in more detail later on. 
Okay, and then of course, open science has some technical implications. I'm highlighting only two of them. Um, the first is licensing, because open science will inevitably, with our current uh, technological trajectory, lead to automation. So even if we can find a very simple machine readable and uncomplicated uh, environment uh, regime for licensing the open outputs from open science, the recombination of these and how to license them automatically is not so straightforward because one has to respect all of the input licenses when doing so. So this whole uh, field of study that's called legal interoperability that refers to how licenses are processed automatically and recombined is an important uh, uh, hidden aspect of open science. And as I said before, the other elephant in the room usually, with a notable exception of the EU, is that these open science policies are usually poorly funded and the infrastructure lag the aspirations of the policymakers almost uh, everywhere in the rest of the world. So looking at this from a broad perspective, I could say that I think the main benefit of science to society in the longer term is the growth in knowledge. Um, but one also has to understand that the definition of knowledge uh, is not clear and is not the same throughout the world. And that leads to quite an interesting number of, of tensions. Um, then one is actually within your rights to say that society wants to benefit from the knowledge generated by science because I would say that with maybe notably exceptions in the US uh, health sector uh, and medical sector and in the IT industry, uh, a very large proportion of uh, scientific research the world over is ultimately funded by, by the taxpayer. Okay. Um, Briefly, then, just a few notes about, uh, about how knowledge works, because we are going to refer to that later on. Um, there are two aspects of uh, knowledge systems that are defined by the experts. The first is the ontology, which is really our systems of belief about reality and whether that can be described objectively, comprehensively, and accurately by science. And of course, this is not always the case uh, unless you are in the hard sciences. And then epistemology, which really the system that you are using to validate your knowledge and to determine whether the facts that you are disseminating to, to others can be replicated or uh, verified in one way or another. So these are are the two building blocks of the paradigms then that are being used by by scientists now there are broadly speaking three of these uh, ones that one could call the i paradigm that says um, one looks at reality dispassionately as an observer and that everybody that looks at the same data and the same reality would ultimately come to the same conclusion uh, based on that observation and that is a very prevalent uh, uh, paradigm, uh, especially in the natural sciences and the hard sciences. But there's also the we paradigm, as it's called, that uh, basically says that there are multiple realities and that every individual experiences reality differently. Uh, and this, of course, is more prevalent in the social and uh, sciences and psychology and so on because it's quite true that it is impossible to, to have exactly the same experience of reality uh, uh, between different individuals. So they need a slightly different paradigm for determining whether something is validated knowledge or not. And then there's an interesting one called the it paradigm, where a large part or a small part, it doesn't really matter, of what we say is knowledge is not tested, but it's assigned to some kind of predefined belief. And it's very interesting that in, uh, in the US, for instance, 
a large proportion of scientists, if we look at this slide, uh, have some a priori, be priori beliefs anyway, um, up to maybe 30%. The percentage in Europe is slightly lower, uh, around a, depending on the country, anything between 15 and 25%. So if we have to summarize in quite a complicated slide, we have these more quantitative paradigms towards the left of your screen and more qualitative ones towards the right. Most of what we regard as reproducible science is somewhere in the middle. Um, and much of what we see as something called indigenous knowledge, for instance, is towards the, the right of this uh, continuum of, of paradigms. Okay, so this is a broad introduction to, to open science and the way in which we can view the knowledge that is generated by it. Uh, so next we think quickly a little bit about how science views uh, open science. Okay, so the scientific methods is probably uh, fairly well known as a term to everybody, but the nuts and bolts of it is not always so, so uh, well understood. If we look at our diagram, then hopefully you can see a fairly, uh, a fairly well emphasized set of arrows going through the process, starting with observations and the questions posed by science, which are then translated uh, into various hypotheses that are tested via experiments or predictions or simulations. And if they are proven, it gives us new evidence and theories that are then subjected to peer review. And that essentially becomes part of our knowledge base as questions answered by science and potentially evidence that can be used uh, by, by um, the broader public uh, for whatever uh, policy or other decisions they have to make. Now, um, the site, the scientific world is fairly adamant that um, this is the way to do things. So about a year ago or so, there were fairly widespread uh, demonstrations in the US to protest the fact that uh, science was not being used uh, very well in the formulation of, of policy. So this poster, I think, is, is a good start where the premise was essentially that scientific research without any political bias is at the root of good policy. So generally speaking, we could say that, yeah, this is, this is not a bad idea. And then coupled to this, we have many of these international uh, developments that are very, very um, uh, explicit in the way that they think their efforts are going to contribute to society. In the field that I work in, in global change science, um, there are organizations like the Group on Earth Observations that make data and especially remotely sense data openly available uh, to everyone. And they are the, the main objective of doing so is that they have a vision of a future where decisions and actions for the benefit of humankind are informed by coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained Earth observations. So again, a lofty ideal uh that uh, they've expressed but in my experience to date the openly available data is there but uh, those benefits have not uh, ensued so directly and similarly the international science council has got a project called future earth where they say that it's vitally important for the scientific community to engage with diverse decision makers in government, the public sector and civil society to co-design and co-produce research to deliver the products and services that society needs. So this is a little bit closer to reality where they understand that there is some kind of more uh, direct and, and useful engagement required between science and, and society to make full use of the benefits that we, that we want to get. The worst one for me is uh, from the Belmont Forum. Uh, the Belmont Forum is a club of the big science funders of the world. South Africa's NRF is also a member. And they have pretty much the same idea of promoting open science 
but they explicitly state in their strategy documents that uh, they will answer the global challenges uh, using an integrated seamless global earth system analysis and prediction system which will provide decision makers with an holistic decision support system and to my as far as i know not one single piece of code or effort has gone into this in the past 10 years so it is really just empty words if they don't do anything about it and really from my experience to build something like this is really a tall order then we also have uh, initiatives in the rest of the world in china they have their very large and very well funded belt and road initiative together uh, supplemented by a digital component and in the belt and road initiative they have the same intentions and that is to use the availability of tools and data to support in this case disaster risk response which in the southeast asian and subcontinental areas and in in east asia is a significant contributor to to human misery on a scale that we rarely see in south africa so very worthwhile in terms of its uh, of its objectives but again not necessarily um, that uh, that um, efficient at delivering results uh, to the to the end user. So I started listing um, some of the structural impediments to translation of evidence into uh, societal benefit. Um, there's uh, seven or so of them listed there. Important ones from my perspective is this mismatch of language, of semantics, where the things that scientists talk about are not necessarily the, uh, the questions or the language uh, that is, that are, that's important to, uh, to the decision makers and to society at large. Uh, the second one is also interesting because researchers often produce very useful evidence and research results but they are not connected into the process of decision and policy making at the correct point and if they are not then their results are not going to be uh, incorporated into anything useful uh, so the rest of those are uh, straightforward i guess in many uh, in many cases um, and then towards the bottom there's also an interesting one and that is the liability of scientists if their evidence are used in in a public setting and proven to be wrong so again with a COVID-19 pandemic this is quite interesting because um, if the scientists got it wrong at the start of the pandemic uh, for whatever reason maybe their information was not uh, not mature yet but it's interesting to contemplate to what extent society can and should hold them responsible for for that evidence if at all and i think the main conclusion from looking at this and if one has to summarize the big uh, disconnect between science and uh, societal benefit then i would say that science is done by specialists so the synthesis of scientific evidence into some kind of social benefit is not in the province of the scientists that do that produce that evidence and they are also not compensated or incentivized uh, to synthesize this into um, into some kind of societal benefit whereas decision support and policy development is usually done by generalists um, that want to synthesize some answer from a large number of inputs from different scientific domains. Um, so that I think is at the root of the problem is that we need a bridge between the generalists and the specialists uh, on both sides of, of this equation. Um, the other interesting part relates to the timing of, of, uh, of outputs from science. If we look at this quickly, then we often have to develop decisions uh, or policy support at, in the bottom arrow um, at a time when the evidence is not yet settled or where the evidence has a high uncertainty or where the best available data is out of date. So again, 
scientists may not necessarily be in a position to improve this situation, but the decision support specialists, um, have, it's incumbent on them to bridge this gap by, by, go, uh, by going an extra mile. So to conclude here, um, some more uh, items from the protests where um, you know, some of them are potentially quite funny, especially the one in the middle uh, with an absolute zero there. But uh, the main thing to take away from these is something that is under the surface and is significant in the developed world. Um, and this is the almost what one could call an uh, elitism or scientism in the sense that uh, science in the United States specifically has a perspective that they have the only answer and that there is uh, no other way to develop uh, policy and decisions except uh, to use scientific evidence, which I think is only partly true. Okay, so let's look at, um, at society. So we can start by thinking about what society wants in a very broad context from open science by uh, thinking about the sustainable development goals, which I think is a fairly neat summary of all the global change challenges that we face and to some extent uh, you know, what we can do or what we should be doing about it. Whether this is feasible or affordable or achievable is of course a different question. Um, but the societal development goals, I think, is, is, a, is an interesting case study to determine the extent to which uh, science is able at the present time to contribute to, to the big societal questions. Now, in South Africa, there are some interesting statistics that we can quickly look at. It's a little bit older, but I doubt whether, um, whether these things have changed very much over the past few years. First of all, uh, there was a survey done, policymakers in government to determine what they see as the main barriers to the use of evidence in formulating their policies. Um, and one can see the contrast between what they think will be useful to them and what they see currently as a barrier. Now, right at the bottom, um, one can see aspects such as the availability and access to, uh, to research and the improved dissemination, which is both uh, a huge facilitator, should it be the case, uh, but currently is a significant barrier. And that's uh, viewed as one of the most important ones. And then the second one is also interesting, the clarity and relevance and reliability of the findings, together with the timing uh, and of, uh, uh, the availability at a specific time of the research findings, things that we've uh, already identified. So the survey to some extent uh, confirms the, the things that we have identified to date as, uh, as impediments to, um, or simple impediments to uh, the use of evidence in policy and decision making. If we look at the process, then we tie uh, the scientific method at the top where we've had some questions answered and evidence uh, available. Uh, if we tie that to what would be a rational policy and decision-making process, then starting from the left, we have global change challenges and the questions posed by society as a result of that. Some of them can be answered directly from evidence produced by science. And some of them, or most of them, I would say, have to be answered on the basis of some cross-domain synthesis, taking evidence from many fields into account. But this is still then a, a fairly technical solution because these solutions uh, have to be contextualized. So in many cases, they have to be modified by societal, economic, or political concerns and their inputs that don't come from science, such as stakeholder consensus and opinions and support or sectarian pressure, uh, all become important. 
if one just thinks about something like the sectarian pressure in South Africa, we have very good examples of this. Um, I can stick my neck out by saying, for argument's sake, that the, the union's resistance to implementation of renewable energy, especially when uh, all the evidence and all the feasibility studies at the moment indicate that uh, this will be cheaper than new coal, but there are significant uh, pressures from sectors of society not to implement uh, these policies. So that's the sort of, uh, how shall I say, the ideal situation when it comes to evidence-based uh, decision making or policy support. Um, but if one then goes and looks at the way in which policies are formulated, and as I say, this research is a bit old, but I don't think it's changed too much, the frightening ones are at the top there, where there is a very large percentage of respondents that base their policies really just on opinion or informal inputs from colleagues or peers. Um, there is a recognition, and this is equally interesting in the middle there, that substantive uh, consultation with the stakeholder community is a, a highly desirable source of input for policy making, um, and that it's also one of the major current sources. But of course, that cannot be the only input because there's no guarantee that a consultation with stakeholders will result in a robust and defensible solution from a technical point of view. So that can only really be used in combination with the outputs towards the bottom there from formal research, from scientific research, and from research syn synthesis. It's interesting that the synthesis uh, is highlighted in this, um, in this survey as being a fairly important desire, desired source of input for policy and decision making, but that in practice, this rarely happens. So um, an important observation there. On a lighter note, um, if we think about the knowledge gaps and the capacity uh, deficit in government generally, when it comes to policy and decision making. Uh, the one that we need to worry about uh, is the one in the top right hand corner. And those are the things that we don't know that we don't know. And this is quite prevalent in government in my experience where uh, the, the formulators of decisions and policy are not aware of the possibilities for supporting that decision in a formal or technical way uh, because the knowledge gap between what they know that science and evidence can provide them with and what is actually possible is quite large and this i think is a capacity building issue that needs uh, urgent attention Okay, so if we look at this wider perspective on knowledge that we had uh, talked about a little bit earlier, then one needs to accommodate potentially multiple paradigms to support uh, this, uh, that result in knowledge in the, in the development of, of policy and decisions. Um, and that is certainly not the perspective in the developed world, but we live in a different uh, situation in our country and we have to accommodate a much wider array of approaches and ideas about how knowledge should be used in decision making. And I've listed some of them in addition to the formal ones towards the top, where there are things like public opinion, deferral to authority where it is quite possible that even though a technical solution or uh, evidence points in a given direction, uh, people in authority are respected and if they make a different decision, then that is it. Um, and then there's a significant use also of unvalidated sources of information and uh, religious or indigenous or cultural knowledge systems. Now, the problem that one faces is that from a Eurocentric point of view, it's easy to dismiss uh, these less formal decision and policy formulation techniques as uh, 
an inclusive environment. So we need to find a different way of addressing the problem. The next two slides are, I'm not gonna go into in detail, but these are examples from at least recent uh, land reform discussions that, we, that I was party to, where um, on the second slide there, we are trying to point out that um, you know, the evidence suggests that even if we reform the entire agricultural sector to the point where each beneficial owner owns the, um, uh, a unit that would produce a, a minimum wage income, it is a drop in the ocean compared to the number of jobs that we have to create uh, on an annual basis even in South Africa. And this kind of, uh, let's say, frankness is lacking from government. So um, you know, land reform is seen as a, as a silver bullet, but in reality, it is anything but that. Okay, and then there's also some indirect societal benefits that I'm not gonna go into in much detail. All right, so, um, in, you can read these in much more detail later on. I've tried to, um, to summarize all of the non-Eurocentric issues with open science or the challenges to open science. Um, but we should move on towards this idea of saying that, okay, what are the gaps in the system? I've summarized them here. There are seven uh, big topics here. The one is about the origins of knowledge that we've discussed decision pathways that we've discussed, um, accessibility that has come out of our survey information and which uh, is of course uh, something that open science wants to solve. There is a trust deficit. This is quite prevalent in the developing world where uh, the motives of especially foreign funded science is not always clear and with reason in some cases, uh, we doubt the, the motives of these uh, investments. And then there are also issues of usability, the evidence gaps, the fact that uh, data is inappropriate or not available at the, at the, at the correct time and so on. Um, <clears throat> the status of science and society is also important, especially in a developing country where it, it could be uh, viewed as an elitist uh, or exclusive uh, endeavor that doesn't include much of the of the general population and then there's also the problem of competitiveness which is quite interesting um, I've come across this especially in the East where the adversarial and uh, questioning nature of scientific engagement that we are used to in the West is really not particularly polite in an Eastern setting because it causes loss of face if we publicly question the results or, or ideas of a colleague. So uh, there are non-African examples of uh, the way in which uh, science at the moment uh, results in systemic gaps. So society expects uh, science to answer all its questions almost uh, automatically, and science expects society without uh, question. But of course, um, this is rarely the case. Um, we had an example when I was doing work in Limpopo some years ago, where an official said that uh, in Limpopo, they throw money into the air and then they pray. So it's essentially what we're doing here on, on a more organized scale where we invest in science in the hope that it will answer our societal question uh, and society has that expectations. But we have to manage this interdependency much more directly and efficiently. Okay, so um, I'm going to conclude with... Are proposing in the field of risk and vulnerability that all the stakeholders agree to some form of, um, of a benefit framework where the, there is a clear pathway 
of how we are going to move from evidence to uh, decision and policy support through phases of analysis and synthesis, in, including the way in which we are going to govern this and how the process is going to work and where and how and when evidence has to slot into this. So there's a lot of detail here where we have started developing frameworks that come from observations and models all the way through variables and indicators to the metrics that society wants. Um, we start with understanding how the observation uh, environment works, translate that into variables, in this case, uh, the capitals that refer to the things that we want to protect or improve and are subject to the drivers and hazards uh, from global change. Um, we then translate that into a set of indicators, uh, all kinds of measurable properties and concepts such as susceptibility, resilience, and so on. And then that results in metrics that are useful for the decision makers and policy makers to understand the impacts, the vulnerabilities, and the risks from global science. So this is an example, very briefly, of the kind of conceptual models that we think are necessary for almost every societal question uh, to bridge the gap between what is observed and produced by science and what the policy makers and decision makers uh, want to do. Now, very important to realize is that the, the results that are useful to society depends on the stakeholder. So if we look at susceptibility, for argument's sake, susceptibility to flooding, uh, then um, the, the view of the stakeholder is very different depending on whether they are government or donors, international donors, or the retail business, for argument's sake, or insurers. Because if someone can cope either via insurance or internal resource, resources with the results of that flooding, then government is really not interested in them. They're only interested in people that are vulnerable. Whereas the insurers, for argument's sake, are, have no interest in the people that are vulnerable and have to be bailed out by government. And they're very interested in the people that are going to claim uh, as a result of that flooding event. So it's very important to understand that each end use uh, potentially has a different set of metrics that they uh, want from the scientific evidence. This is a little obtuse, but essentially almost our uh, last slide, where we are arguing for in these formal frameworks that we explicitly account for political, social, economic, environmental uh, concerns, where if we, for argument's sake, have an approach where we are looking for optimum solutions, then we must calculate that optimum solution taking all of the social, political, and environmental constraints into account, and then contrast that with a technical solution only. And the reason we are doing this is that it is not wrong to take social or political considerations into account when making a decision, but it's vitally important to understand what it's gonna cost. And the only rational way to do this is for argument's sake in deciding about global change responses, or renewable energy or any of these aspects, it is very, very important for us to, um, to understand the impact of the, uh, of the uh, societal and environmental decisions that we add into our uh, considerations. Okay, so to conclude then, uh, open science in combination with benefit frameworks, if we look at our set of issues that we've identified, the systemic gaps, then the ones that we mark in green are things that must be answered with a benefit framework. Uh, open science alone is not going to give us uh, any kind of leverage to improve on those. Whereas the ones that are marked in light blue are the ones that will be taken care of by open science. So essentially, we're saying that, um, uh, that uh, by combining benefit frameworks with the movement of open science, we are aiming to bridge the gap between evidence and decision-making. 
Um, the rest of my talk deals with aspects of trust. Um, those are really just uh, for interest. Um, I think we will not have much time to dwell on that in today's uh, talk, but um, essentially we are saying that if we automate and increasingly want to uh, involve machine learning and artificial intelligence into our open science environment, then the automated establishment of trust is actually critical. Um, I'm currently working in the Core Trust SEAL organization that certifies trusted digital repositories in respect of their practices and their quality assurance. Um, but this is a very manual process at the moment. So one of the future directions that uh, is required for the widespread automation of open science is this idea that machine to machine transactions uh, must be possible um, with third party verification of trust. So if we just quickly look at one of those um, examples, then um, uh, we have a third party that potentially verifies uh, the trust component um, and provides research outputs uh, to, uh, from one individual to another one by storing it on a, in a repository somewhere. And the most important aspects of this, number one, is that this becomes scalable because it doesn't need individual to individual contact if uh, many people want to make use of a trusted uh, environment. And then we can also replace humans anywhere in that chain with machine, uh, machine driven uh, routines without affecting, uh, without affecting the situation. So I would argue that, um, that trust and the automation of trust is something that is going to prove to be critical to the infrastructure environment um, that, we, that we build for implementation of open science. Okay, so I'm going to conclude there and um, with the thought that ultimately, uh, or let's say traditionally, uh, we have done science for the purpose of, uh, of science alone and answering interesting questions that are posed by science, but there is an increasing uh, demand and uh, rightly so from society that science must have a more direct benefit. So uh, the interesting governance question for the funders of the world is how to, how to address this problem by having a uh, defensible ratio between uh, applied research that answers questions directly and uh, open research that um, is there just for the benefit of science alone. So thanks very much. And of course, time for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Bim, for a, for a fantastic talk that uh, definitely increased our knowability of, uh, of open science. So probably none of us is anymore in the upper right corner in the little matrix that you have shown in, uh, in one of your nice, nice slides. You know, I'm, uh, I'm really very excited about these developments because, you know, I went to university in the, you know, I out my age in the, in the early 80s, at a time where <clears throat> open software or free software started to become a, a, a trend yeah, in, in, in certain circles. And it's really nice to see how those crazy ideas of some geeks that uh, wrote the first freely accessible editors yeah, uh, now are growing in, into a really fully fledged uh, knowledge system. Ilya, I see that there are a few questions to start with. Would you like to, to, to guide us to the question and answer session? And, uh, and yeah. please, participants, use of the Q&A button at the bottom to share <clears throat> your, your, your questions. OK, so the first, the first thing I want to ask you is because uh, thank you very much for the very nice talk. But, and the question is, like, uh, will, will the slides be available because people are very interested in seeing kind of and reading and follow up with the slides, would they be available publicly afterwards? 
Yes, most certainly. So I'll share via Francesco, so um, uh, openly available. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And the second question is related a little bit more to the South African content, and it's uh, uh, what do you think are implications of the POPIA on open science? Yes, so um, I think it has some practical or technical implications, of course, uh, in the sense that uh, people who have dissemination infrastructure and so on have to deal within the bounds of the, of the legislation with uh, the user's information. But that's really not the, the most important aspect. Um, in the policy work that we are contributing to DSI at the moment, we are advocating for a general machine readable license that can be used in South Africa for uh, what we call no harm situations. So this includes data that is personal, data that may have some commercial uh, application or implications, things that could lead to exploitation of natural resources, uh, uh, the distribution for argument's sake of endangered species like rhino. All of those categories need to be covered by a license that places obligations on the disseminator to determine the motives and the application of that data on behalf of the depositor. So I think the, the, the problem can be addressed by having appropriate licenses that define the responsibilities of the dissemination infrastructure uh, clearly when it comes to personal information. Okay, so there is one more question. Uh, one of the big drivers, as you said, is in, uh, investor investment. Do these drivers influence or affect the integrity of the science outcome? Well, I think that probably depends on the, on the scientist, but if we are looking at the end user perspective, one of the goals of open science is to make proper metadata available. In essence, who funded this research, who conducted it and so on. So that maximum uh, information in respect of reusability is available to the end user. And that, I think, is something that uh, one has to then say, the end user will have to uh, review the available metadata for that information source and make his or her own decision. In some case, and one also really cannot make that decision on behalf of the end user because, as I indicated, um, the end users uh, are very different and one can't predict that from a data perspective. So the best option we have from an infrastructure point of view is to provide maximum metadata with uh, each of these uh, research outputs. Okay, thank you. Can, can I ask a question, Vim? You know, over the last few weeks uh, in, in this webinar series, we had many talks ab about COVID and uh, various aspects of, of, of the pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, and one of the things that, uh, that uh, this, this, this global pandemic made evident is that uh, there are really serious uh, structural issues in, in how the, the, the world is, is run that uh, did make it easy to defeat the pandemic. Yeah? And do you yes. think that the, that the open science framework uh, um, benefited in a certain sense from the pandemic and, and will maybe assist us in, uh, in, in making those um, kind of pro profound societal structural changes that we need to, to, to achieve so that something like this doesn't happen anymore? Um, I think yes, in broad terms, because I think it has highlighted the, the usefulness potentially of having open research outputs available that meet certain criteria. You might have heard of things like FAIR or trust principles that look at the technicalities of making sure that data is available and findable and interoperable and so on, and that it can be trusted. 
Um, but that comes back to my argument that the real benefit will not be realized until we have an agreed societal benefit framework. If we look at the South African situation for argument's sake, um, we can go to the Stats SA website to download demographic data and so on and so on, but it's not really clear and predetermined how we should then translate that into populations that are susceptible to some kinds of illnesses. So for argument's sake, if we already had that available and we already had things like the capacities and locations of, uh, of medical facilities available as an open uh, data source within a framework, then a lot of the social and economic questions around the pandemic would have been readily available to, to decision makers. As it was, even if those data sets are, are reasonably available, they are not standardized, they're not well described, they are not decision ready in a way that they should be and could be if we really want to, to prepare for future pandemics. Thank you. And Ilya, I see there is one more question in the Q&A. Yes. So uh, the question is, the historical research data, cultural and educational collections are sometimes hard to locate. This raises the importance of the digitization. What are skill levels in the country regarding the digitization of the archives? Yeah. I can only speak for, for a limited uh, scope uh, because I was involved in earth and environmental science here locally. And um, there are very limited resources available for digitization uh, of historical data in, in that field. Um, SANBI, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, uh, now has government funding for establishing a research uh, infrastructure that will, amongst other things, digitize their historical holdings together with some of the biodiversity samples in museums and so on. But that's really the tip of the iceberg. And um, Scion that I was involved with, the Environmental Observation Network, they have uh, large stores of paper uh, records and documents that were uh, entrusted to them by retiring researchers from an earlier era, if one could put it that way, that, uh, we, that they have struggled to date to find funding for uh, to digitize and preserve digitally. So I would, I would guess that the situation is the same in other fields of science. It is a lack of funding that I think is, is restricting the digitization of these historical records. Okay. Yeah, there is one uh, last question. Yes, and the people are also curious about the link which you have uh, to, the, to uh, the reference which you have in, in your slide, which is now online, this reimagining science in the changing world. Is this, uh, is, is this uh, publication is in the public domain or not yet? Not yet. So this is an effort uh, that I'm involved with that is a there's an organization called Data Together that combines the Research Data Alliance that you may have come across, uh, CoData, the GoFair organization that is promoting uh, fair data and the World Data System. And we are trying to develop inputs for UNESCO's big process to uh, engage with governments starting early next year uh, on the future of open science. So that's maybe something to note that we haven't discussed. Uh, we've been providing on and off in various ways, or I have been involved in some task teams on and off to, to write inputs for UNESCO, but we should be ready for a big push from the United Nations starting probably next year to engage with governments uh, in respect of open science and trying to make sure that the benefits of science um, find traction in the developing world. So that's quite a positive development. 
So to cut a long story short, uh, not yet, but hopefully within a month or two, we will be in a position to publish that document. Yeah, Vim, there doesn't seem to be any more uh, urgent question. So <clears throat> thank you so much for, for your time this morning and, and for sharing this, this really uh, exciting uh, development developments and we will definitely follow follow you now that um, uh, that you raise the, the, the interest in uh, in um, in, our, in the participants to, to, to the webinar so we wish you all the best in your in your new job <laughs> that you probably will start as soon as the plane starts operating again That's across right. <laughs> So all, all, all the best for that. And um, we will definitely uh, stay in contact and maybe ask us ask you in, uh, in, in your time to give us an update on, on, on the development of open science in, um, globally and, and in particular in, in our South African context. So thank yes. you very much, Jim, and uh, have a good day. And thank you very much to all the, the, the loyal participants of, of our webinar series. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. And we will send out uh, the announcements for the next webinar uh, probably just later today. So thank you very much. Have a good day and, uh, and, and a nice uh, weekend. But most important of all, keep staying safe. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Bye -bye. Thank you as well. Yeah. Thank you.